And we are back for episode 5. In this episode, I'd like to divert our attention away from the East and focus a little bit more on Oregion. Our episode opens with a quiet overview of the orcs creating some siege weapons, as well as some minor fortifications outside the walls. There are a few skirmishes which reach the walls and a few traded arrows while Erendir attempts to use a combination of sorties and under-exaggerations of strength to entice the orcs to assault the fortress, but in the end, no assault comes. We see that there are only about one or two thousand orcs besieging the fortress. Arendir Deer then turns to Gath and sorrowfully states that they're going to wait for a siege. Still, we see the large provisions which have been made and that the fortress has been fully prepared. Erendir readies his men for the siege, and they hold firm under the initial harassments of the orcs. In our next scene, we have Celebrimbor meeting with Narvi in the halls of Khazadum. We can see that the city is still under construction, and overall it should look like the beginnings of what we see in Lord of the Rings. Long, tall pillars hold up the main hall, as Celebrimbor is led to the king. Narvi introduces Celebrimbor to King Durin, and the king, while remaining dignified and being sure not to dote upon his guest, still rises and bows to Celebrimbor and leads him to the dining hall. A great feast is laid out. It is not quite on the level of splendor the audience may be used to when it comes to the food, but the table, the arraignment of jewels, and everything else having to do with the metalwork is of such exquisite craftsmanship that Celebrimbor cannot help but marvel and compliment the dwarves for their grandeur. Indeed, Indeed, he says, you and your people have never failed to impress me with all the wonders you are able to produce with just the power of your hands and a few simple tools. His eyes dart to Narvi for a moment and he smiles. And some elvish advice, of course. Narvi smiles at the comment and replies, Father, what my friend here says is silliness. Our greatest towers do not match the grandeur of their cities. Our tools are as nothing compared to the great elven swords and armor. It will drive a mind to fascination beyond belief seeing what the elves are capable of. With the help of the dwarves, that is. Both Celebrimbor and Narvi smile profusely at their comments, while Durin shakes his head at their ridiculous friendship and begins discussing various small matters. Durin says that he has heard that Celebrimbor's king and queen have returned from their journey north, and Celebrimbor confirms. Durin asks if they have completed their task, with Celebrimbor saying that he can't be quite sure, and that there are likely other problems with the world they will need to bring their attention to, but he says nothing about what these problems might be. Narvi then remembers that they were set to complete the morning a gate within a month or so, but Celebrimbor says that he might not be able to attend them for some time. What do you mean? Narvi asks. Celebrimbor pauses for a moment before saying, I'm not quite sure I will be able to have the time for travel over the coming months. It pains me as much as you, but I'm afraid we may have to postpone the completion of the Moria Gate. Narvi smiles and looks suspiciously at his friend. This is not merely to prolong our completion of it, I hope. My friend, as I said only a few months ago, we shall no doubt find another task on which we can both work. Celebrimbor frowns once more, but nods. We see that King Durin has paused his eating to look in disguised disbelief at his elvish guest. Say, my good elf, I was informed recently that your kingdom has also been receiving a guest of great prestige. Am I correct? Celebrimbor gives a momentary bit of shock at the question. Oh, yes, a herald from the West who has taken to instructing many of the craftsmen of our realm. The guilds are currently working on various devices to see if the advice that he gives us will prove at all useful. And... What is your opinion on the matter? The king asks. Celebrimbor smiles. I am always looking for additional help wherever I can get it. The art of smithery is held by no individual. It is shared by all. And one of the great glories of friendship, he turns over to Narvi, is in the sharing of knowledge. That is, I believe, the key to the mutual success of our realms. Durin nods. Well spoken, my friend. After Celebrimbor leaves, we see the king and Narvi going about their daily business. When they're alone, the king turns to Narvi. You notice it as well, I hope. Hmm? Surely you detected the strange behavior of your friend this evening. Indeed, I would have imagined you would have been the first to figure it out. Figure what out? Celebrimbor is hiding something. Oh, that. Yes, I'm already aware of this. Ever since Saleh's messenger arrived, the elves have been working on some secret project or something along those lines. And you decided not to notify me about this? I didn't think it was worthy of concern. Not worth... <sighs> My son, the elves are meant to be very intimate trading and business partners, and yet they're keeping secrets from us? How could that not be considered worthy of concern? Does that not at least seem a little inappropriate? <sighs> Father, I don't think this is the time for being suspicious. We have worked hard to establish a real sense of trust between our kingdoms. Ah, but that is why I am worried. It seems the elves do not trust us. 
That is one possibility, of course, but they could just as easily be under direction not to reveal any specifics from this Aulen deal that Celebrimbor has told me about. I still don't like it. We need to find out what they're up to. Narvi sighs again. Very well, father, but let me, if I may, recommend caution rather than haste. We will discover the truth of this matter one way or another, and it will certainly be the benefit of our realm if we do so naturally rather than by force. King Durin considers this for a moment before nodding. You are growing to be a truly wise dwarf, my son. That will do you well as king. Very well. We shall wait before making any hasty action. But if the elves do not reveal their task in some manner by the spring's end, we must discover what they are up to. Narvi bows to his father. In our next scene, we see Glorfindel apart from the Harfoots early in the morning. He's searching various paths in the forest for traces of where the wargs from last episode came from, as he somehow lost the warg he was following. Eventually, he rediscovers the warg tracks and begins to follow them, but is interrupted by Marigold, who accuses him of trying to run away from them. Marigold! What are you doing here? This isn't safe. Did you not see how many of you were killed by just a few of those creatures? It's clear that Marigold isn't paying attention. I should have known that you'd try to abandon me. You've been keeping secrets this entire time, ever since you first agreed to come, and now you're going to leave without even saying good- Marigold, keep your voice down. No, you're not going to tell me what to do. Ah, so you really are aligned with the halflings, a voice says from behind the trees. We turn to find Kamu, riding upon a black horse and being surrounded by his guards. What value you find in them, I'm not sure. They would make good spies, I suppose, but that's not even how you're using them. Glorfindel draws his sword and says calmly, Who are you? Kamu is caught off guard by the elf's serenity. Then, he smiles. Admittedly, I am someone of little importance compared to you. You threaten to harm innocent men and women. Surely you do not mean to imply that this does not increase your importance to me. Innocent? I know of no such people. Make no mistake, Elf. The people you guard are no more innocent than my own, and you ought not to make so many hasty judgments about circumstances of which you only just now grasp. You are attempting to turn me aside from the path set for me by the Valar. You must forgive me if I do not accept your judgment on the innocence of others. I have told no lie. That was not my contention. Hamel shakes his head and sends the wargs to attack Glorfindel. We then get a relatively quick battle, where the ten wargs charge him at once. He kills two of them with relative ease as they approach, but the wargs coordinate to attack his limbs, causing him to drop his sword. Within a moment, Glorfindel stumbles with a warg biting each of his limbs and the lead warg jumping to attack his neck. He manages to dodge this by throwing all of his weight to one side and collapsing on top of the warg biting his sword arm. With the wargs overwhelmed by the force of his fall, the lead warg once again attempts to go for a kill while another warg swipes at his back. Glorfindel then retrieves his sword and kills the lead warg. He then whips out a small dagger from his belt and kills the two wargs attempting to reattach to his legs. The rest of the wargs retreat and there is a standoff. Hamel, however, seeing that this battle is ultimately pointless, knowing that Glorfindel will simply heal most of his wounds within a day or so, instead takes a different tactic. Very well. We'll have to finish this later. For now, make your choice. He sends the wargs to attack the Harfoots while they're making their way up the river. They chase them through the Emin Muil, while Hamel retreats on his horse and Glorfindel is torn between pursuing him and saving the Harfoots. He spots Marigold trying to go back to her family and, cursing himself, goes after her. We then see that the wargs have called together a great number of their kind, though why they did not all go to attack Glorfindel is unclear. Glorfindel then realizes that Marigold is going to get herself killed as she tries to fight the wargs blocking her path to the rest of the Harfoots. Therefore, Therefore, he saves her and brings her westwards into the forest to flee the frenzied wolves. In our next scene, we see Varix, the king of Angmar, emerging from his own personal chambers in a tower within Galadriel and Celeborn's palace. He seems to be questioning something as he starts pacing back and forth until one of his servants arrives. Uh, you, you called your grace, the servant says. Eirik, what is your opinion on all we have learned these past few months? It's not my place to question. It's your place to question when I tell you to. Tell me the effect of what you have learned. Eirik bows his head. Well, your grace, I have learned how to read and write. I have learned the history of Middle-earth and the lands beyond our own. I have learned much about the ways of the world, and, and I have even been given instruction on how I may best advise you. Varex looks concerned. Is that all? Have you learned any means of power? I have studied military history and learned much better ways to organize armies. Varix nods and seems to breathe a sigh of relief. Good. I believe I can work with this. Your grace. Varix turns his head towards his servant. 
I have learned much in my time here as well, but nothing has been anywhere near as useful in our struggle to survive as what I have received from my forefathers. If I may, your grace, Eric says cautiously, I appreciate the need to survive more than many of our other members of court, as I'm sure you know, but we have fought so long and so hard against the orcs. Our people know of little else but war. The elves are offering us a life beyond the mere struggles with orcish raids, and if we learn from them, we may, as you said, become truly great in our own right. You've been learning persuasion from them as well, I see. Eirik briefly blushes from embarrassment before regaining himself. But what I've said is true nonetheless, and I believed what you say. I really did. Why has your mind changed, your grace? Varix once more snaps at the younger man. Because I don't have time for this. The elves have taken nearly two seasons to teach us the most rudimentary of administrative and literary skills. At this rate, it will take ages before any of us are masters enough to teach these skills to our own people. He shakes his head. We are children indeed, but children already on our deathbed, with disease and assassins lurking in every corner. It was foolish of me to believe I could end our people's curse. Your grace, Eirik says, bowing. While what you are saying may be true, do we not have hope that we shall survive this time of troubles? Our people have been given a great fortress over which to look, and we have men learning many crafts of farming which we could use even now to help our people. Varix shakes his head. I have no heir, Eirik. The woman I love died years ago, and in my foolishness I never took another. If I do not create peace for our kingdom before I die, it shall not last. Eirik bows lower as he speaks with greater caution than ever before. It is certainly not my place to judge motive, your grace, but, as you know, friends may often have insights into another man which he himself lacks. Is it not possible that you are associating your own good with the good of Angmar? Varric's eyes his servant with a mixture of anger and shame. Get out, is all he says. Eirik bows and leaves, and Varric is left for a few moments to his own thoughts before Eirik returns with Alendil. Varric's face convulses into anger when he sees the one he believes to be a false envoy. What is he doing here? Eirik carries a nervous expression. Pardon, your grace, please. He absolutely insisted on seeing you. Varric glares at Alendil. Do you think you can abuse my servants without punishment? He approaches the envoy. I don't care if you're some envoy from the West, I will find a way to make you pay if you do anything to disturb my people. Varix dismisses him and turns to go. How long do you think it will last? Alendil says. Varix pauses. Surely, you know. Once you pass, so does the gift. Varix turns to Alendil with poison in his eyes. He squints with suspicion at the envoy, who is simply standing at the center of the room, his own face expressionless. What do you want? In truth, I have not come to get anything from you. Lord of Gifts, my friend Celebrimbor calls me, and so I am. I have come to give you something that will help your people with their orcish problem. Varex's frown deepens. I'm listening. In our next scene, we see Glorfindel speaking with a group of Entwives, warning them of the danger and telling them to alert the settlements of men. You've once again forgotten about the halflings! Marigold screams at him. Glorfindel sighs, then adds, Please also try to find the Harfoots in the stores. The Harfoots have a slightly darker complexion than you're probably used to. They were attacked by the wargs, and I am worried for their safety. He glares back at Marigold. Marigold, Glorfindel yells. I have tried to be patient and kind to you and your people, and you all have repaid me with deceptions and delays. You used me in your ridiculous and pointless politicking, and now you are actively hampering my mission. I didn't want any of that stupid family stuff. I just wanted a friend. I don't have time for a friend, Marigold. The evil of Morgoth and his followers has not gone from the world. If I do not warn the kingdoms of the High Elves, you are all going to die. Marigold stops, and her eyes widen. What? Glorfindel breathes a sigh of frustration at his mistake. Go back to your people, if you can. I've already wasted more than a season. Reluctantly, he looks at the Endwives and says, And I have a better guide now. He follows the Endwives and goes up the hill they are leading before pausing. He turns around and looks back towards the east, not towards Marigold, but instead to the lands beyond the Anduin. He is clearly troubled and hesitates when one of the Endwives calls for him to follow looking almost as if he's reluctant to do what he had just said. We then see a scene where Alendil and Celebrimbor are working on the Nine Rings. The work is put in the form of a montage, implying that these things happened over the course of several months, or maybe even years. While working, we see the envoy give various pieces of advice on how to achieve
achieve mastery over the powers of the world, sharing notes and making suggestions, but above all watching with a keen eye all the actions of his fellow smiths. Celebrimbor, he says, smiling profusely. I must admit, I have never seen a smith quite on your level. You are master not only of gifts, but of flattery, my lord. But surely, you do not wish to say that I exceed the skill of my grandsire, Feanor. It is well known that in comparison to all the other craftsmen of the world, he alone stands as a star of unimpeachable brightness. Next to him, I am but a paltry blacksmith, a maker and repairer of horseshoes, not fit to be called a master. Perhaps, Alendil says, though I will admit that I never saw Feanor as a smith. So secretive he was, after all. Calibrimbor laughs for a moment, assuming this to be a joke. Elendil continues. Besides, of all the crafts of Feanor, were not as great as the Silmarils, gems meant for his own enjoyment? These rings, however, these are the works intended for the salvation of the world, in addition to their unmatchable achievement. The Silmarils brought destruction. These will bring new life. The Silmarils preserved the light of the two trees. These, these will preserve the light of the whole world. Surely you understand why I hold these in higher estimation than the works of Feanor. Celebrimbor smiles and nods before returning to his work. Aulendil continues to watch before gaining a contemplative expression. One of the other elven smiths looks at him. My lord, what is it? Oh, nothing. I'm merely considering something about our lord Celebrimbor. It is possible. Yes, I th think he may truly be worthy. Celebrimbor stops again. Worthy, my lord. Alendil blushes. That probably wasn't the wisest thing to say. He then sighs. <sighs> I know of many arts, which are usually considered too dangerous to teach, even to elves, but you, my lord, may be the exception. Celebrimbor almost reflexively genuflects in front of Alendil. My lord, I am honored that you would even consider me worthy of such gifts. I know not what to say other than to ask, to what do these arts pertain? Alendil hesitates taking Celebrimbor's hands and then raising him to his feet. I am afraid I need more discernment time, my friend. I worry that my judgment may not be as impeccable as I had once thought. Why do you say this? Well, your Lady Galadriel seems not to trust my judgments. Surely, he turns to the entire guild, we all understand why the lack of confidence from one so widely known for her wisdom would cause doubt for one's own mind. My lord, one of the smiths says, do not rely on Galadriel for your own estimation. Celebrimbor hesitates, but eventually adds, I would not ordinarily be so bold, but I do think the Lady Galadriel's sight is not as keen when it comes to our current task. Alendil raises an eyebrow. Indeed? Hmm. Perhaps you are right. Our Lady does not seem to understand the gravity of the situation, or the extent of our work here. He shakes his head. I did not plan on telling you all this, but... I have heard it said that she wishes to restrict or even enclose this guild of ours. Shock echoes throughout the hall. I do not believe this is true, he quickly adds. I believe this is based on the suspicions of some of our members who have seen her and our lord Celebrimbor lurking throughout the guild. They've been watching us, we hear a voice say. Will Galadriel let jealousy ruin our work? Another cries out. Enough, Alendil says. He shakes his head and turns to Celebrimbor. My lord. In either case, this should not pose any problems to you. You, yourself, are a lord of Eregion in your own right. She cannot merely strip you of your rights and powers. As he says this, we see Celebrian enter the guild and walk towards them. Elendil spots her and calls out, Ah, the silver star of the Eldar has blessed us with her presence. He bows low and kisses her hand as she draws near. My dearest, what can I do for you? Calabrian fights a blush as she says, I wanted to let you know that my mother and father are coming here, and mother seems particularly angry with you. She's coming to close the guild, one of the smiths says hysterically. What? No, that's not what she's after, Calabrian insists. We shall see, my darling, Alendil says. Right on cue, Galadriel and Caliborn enter the guild with some of their guard. Aulendil, Galadriel yells, your ruse is up. I have received word from the High King and learned of your harassing my guests. I will tell Lady Galadriel, Aulendil bellows before putting on a conciliatory smile. The violence of the outburst and the odd juxtaposition of the smile throws Galadriel off balance. I am afraid, he continues with a softer voice, that my fate is not currently in your power. I am under the protection of our Lord Celebrimbor, if he will provide it. Galadriel looks around and sees that all the smiths have turned against her. She turns to Celebrimbor. My Lord Celebrimbor, she begins, this man has long overstepped what is proper in his dealings with us as envoy of Valinor. For the good of Eregion, and on behalf of the High King, I bid you, please turn him over to me. 
We will not, Celebrimbor says, hand over our rights and jurisdictions to you. Galadriel looks at him confused. What? are you talking about? I, I wonder, Alendil interrupts, whether one's so hasty and fickle and turning away, guess, from the Valar themselves, will respect the rights and privileges she has granted to her inferiors. This comment foments anger throughout the guild, and Galadriel, after giving Alendil one final stare of hatred, leaves with her husband and guard. In our next scene, we see Marigold crying, her eyes glued to the ground, stumbling her way through the forest back to the river when suddenly she hears what at first feels like a stampede. She sneaks her way through the forest and sees a massive army of wargs and men moving west. It takes her only a few seconds to realize what is going on. She quickly looks around, trying to find some form of help, and spots smoke coming up from what is likely a settlement of men. She wipes her eyes as she gains a newly determined look. She pulls out a small amulet, which has been shown in previous shots to belong to her grandmother, and she runs towards the smoke as quickly as she can. And in our final scene for the episode, we turn to the fortress of Eminarnan. It is at sunset, and we see that the walls have taken some wear and tear from the siege weapons of the orcs, and the supplies have been nearly spent. The men all have heavy, baggy eyelids, while the elves remain vigilant. Even so, they appear to be getting more and more tired as the siege wears on. Even Arendir appears exhausted in his command, but attempts to persevere throughout and provide encouragement to the defenders. Then, just as the sun becomes no longer visible, the assault horn of the orcs sounds, and the defenders are snapped out of their malaise. Arendir looks at the fortress in sorrow, and yet, despite the sorry state, regains his resolve. Now, my friends, he shouts to the rest of the defenders, we at last have a chance to destroy the orcs in this land for good. 